Welcome back to the tutorial on games that arise from logic and automata. We are now going to uh, take a look at another motivation for considering uh, games on graphs, and in particular, again, uh, parity games. So it has to do with complete lattices. So what is a complete lattice? It's a partial order uh, with some set elements uh, L, and we will say that it is a complete lattice if for every subset of elements of uh, the ground set, so for every subset A, there is a greatest lower bound of all the elements in that subset A and the least uh, upper bound. In the lattice theoretic jargon, the greatest lower bound is uh, often referred to as the meat of the set A and the least upper bound is referred to as the join of uh, that set. Now, a paradigmatic example of a complete lattice is the power set lattice. So, for any set U, if you take the um, set of subsets of that set, ordered by inclusion, then that is a complete lattice, where the meet, the greatest lower bound, of any collection of sets is the intersection of this uh, of the sets in that collection, and uh, the least upper bound, the join, uh, is the union of those. A classic result of Tarski, uh, building on uh, earlier results of Knaster, is that if uh, you take a function f from a complete lattice to itself, and that function is monotone, uh, which means that it is order preserving, then the set of all fixed points of that function f, right? so all elements of L which are equal to their image by f, that set of fixed points is a complete lattice itself. Now let's parse that. So that in particular uh, implies that the least fixed point of f exists and the greatest fixed point of f exists. This follows from the fact that every complete lattice has a least element and the greatest element, uh, which are simply the join and the meet of all elements uh, in the lattice. Moreover, uh, Tarski's theorem uh, implies that those least and greatest fixed points of a monotone function uh, can be obtained by a fairly uh, straightforward calculation. Namely, uh, in order to obtain the least fixed points, all we need to do is to take the join of all the iterations of f starting from the bottom element, the smallest element uh, in the complete lattice, and the greatest fixed point can be obtained by taking the meet of all the uh, iterates of f starting from the top element in, in the lattice. Before we define uh, nested knaster tarski fixed points, um, let me clarify in what sense we can take um, least and greatest fixed points of multivariate functions. Uh, uh, on complete lattices. So functions of the form a finite product of the lattice, um, of the complete lattice into itself. So firstly, it makes sense to talk about such functions as being monotone because um, a finite product uh, of a complete lattice can be seen again as a complete lattice uh, with the pointwise uh, ordering. Now, if we have a diary uh, such monotone function, then uh, if we agree on some, uh, say, first argument of that function, let's call it um, x, then what we can do is that we can define a d minus 1 array function, which to every d minus 1 uh, tuple of elements in the lattice, uh, yields the least fixed point of the unary function, which to argument x gives uh, the outcome of applying f to x and that d minus 1 uh, tuple. 
Uh, we can do likewise for the greatest fixed points. Uh, admittedly, this notation is a bit of a abuse here because obviously uh, uh, in order for this to make sense, we have to somehow agree on what the first argument is, the one with respect to which we take a, a least fixed point. And we can uh, similarly define greatest fixed points of such uh, multivariate uh, monotone functions um, from a lattice to itself uh, in the analogous way. Now, the fact stated here is that uh, such d minus 1 array functions obtained in the way I've described, uh, when understood as lattice theoretic functions uh, from d minus 1 uh, product of L to L uh, are monotone themselves. This is uh, not too hard to prove, uh, and we will use this fact uh, to define the nested cluster Tarski fixed points. So uh, again, uh, assume that we have a function f from a d-wise product of L into itself, and what we are now going to define is the meaning of this expression, which takes repeated um, least and greatest fixed points with respect to uh, the parameters, uh, uh, all the d parameters. So it takes the least fixed point of f with respect to the first parameter x1 that gives a d minus 1 array function uh, in the remaining arguments, then it takes the greatest fixed point, and so on. So here's the definition. Uh, so um, f is um, a d array uh, function, monotone function from a lattice to itself. Now we define uh, the meaning of this expression mu x1 dot f of uh, the vector of axis as this d minus 1 array function. Uh, which is simply the least fixed point of the unary function with respect to um, argument x1. Now, once we have this d minus 1 array function, uh, we can define a d minus 2 array function uh, by, say, taking the greatest fixed point uh, with respect to um, variable uh, parameter x2. So, in this way, we can keep applying the uh, least and greatest uh, fixed point operators, uh, which each time we yield monotone functions, and hence uh, we can meaningfully uh, continue applying uh, least and greatest fixed point operators, thanks to Tar Tarski's theorem, until uh, we have applied these fixed point operators um, d times. Um, and then what we get is a zero array function, so we, we just get an element of the lattice itself. So that's the meaning of a nested fixed point expression uh, which starts from uh, a d array function f and then applies the least and greatest fixed point operators to successive parameters of that function um, and uh, thus defines an element uh, of the lattice. Um, so here is um, a construction which uh, you may find um, somewhat surprising because we suddenly shift from uh, fixed points in lattices and the Tarski, uh, Knaster Tarski theorem uh, to parity games. Uh, but here's a construction of a finite parity game if the original lattice was uh, finite. Uh, and for simplicity, uh, I'm going to, in fact, uh, assume that the lattice uh, that we uh, are uh, working with is a power set uh, lattice. Turns out that uh, uh, the generalization to uh, arbitrary lattices uh, is uh, uh, maybe not very enlightening, so, so uh, we can uh, see what is really going on already for the case, special case of power set lattices. So imagine that we have a function, a DRA function, uh, from the power set uh, of uh, some set of uh, set u into uh, into itself. Um, and we are now going to define a parity game which will have two types of uh, positions or vertices. Um, the square ones will belong to player even and the pentagon ones uh, will belong to player odd. So recall if a vertex or a position in a parity game has an odd number of sides, in this case 5, then it belongs to odd, 
and if it has an even number of sides then it belongs to even that's our uh, convention uh, now the vertices that belong to even uh, will be pairs an element of the ground set of our power set uh, lattice and um, a number p which is a positive integer from the range between 1 and d. Now recall d is the arity of the monotone function. Positions that belong to odd instead are going to be um, d tuples of elements of the lattice. In this case the elements of the power set lattice are simply subsets of u. So they are d tuples of sets um, uh, uh, of subsets of u. What are the moves? Uh, so maybe let's first talk about the moves available to player odd from a d-tuple of sets. Um, player odd will be able to move from such a tuple to pair u p if and only if that element u of the set capital U belongs to the pth subset of u in the tuple. Now what moves? So far note we haven't used the function f at all. Uh, function f is used to determine which edges we have from positions that belong to even to positions that belong to odd. Note that this graph is bipartite, so every move from an even position moves, uh, goes to an odd position and vice versa. But it is the moves from the even positions to the odd positions that are going to refer to uh, this function f, this monotone function. So we will say that there is an edge from u p, where p recall is uh, positive integer between 1 and d, if and only if u belongs to f applied to that d-tuple of subsets of u that this edge is supposed to go to. Now note that f is monotone, so the set of edges going out of a pair up has um, quite a bit of structure. It is uh, 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 in a sense uh, upwards uh, upwards closed. So this completes the definition of uh, the transition structure of this game. The only thing remaining is to for it to become uh, a party game is to determine what the priorities of uh, the vertices or the positions uh, are and uh, the all the odd positions are going to have priority one which is the smallest priority so that's the priority that matters the least. And uh, all the positions of even will simply have the priority of the second element of that pair, up. So all those vertices, all those positions will have priority, uh, priority p. Uh, and here is a remarkable uh, fact, uh, which is that an element u of the set of the universe, uh, capital U, is belongs to the set defined by this nested Knastatarsky uh, expression that we have defined uh, on the previous uh, slide, if and only if even, player even, has a winning strategy from any of the positions of the form u, comma, some priority, in that uh, nested fixed point um, game. Now note that it doesn't really matter from which priority in the second uh, component of this pair we start from because uh, the set of sets of successes uh, of positions of the form up are completely independent of uh, that component p. Right? They only depend on, uh, on, uh, on u. So uh, this gives, in a way, a game theoretic semantics or meaning uh, of uh, such nested Knastatarsky uh, fixed point expressions. Um, and um, 
I find it quite um, uh, enlightening because it transforms a problem which is lattice theoretic and talks about <clears throat> fixed points in um, perhaps sometimes quite complex lattices, uh, and that translates it to a purely, purely combinatorial uh, problem of uh, determining uh, winners uh, in parity games. It is worth pointing out here that the number of distinct priorities that are used in this parity game, the fixed point game associated with the uh, nested Knastetarski fixed point expression, is equal to the number of alternating fixed point operators. So if you have nesting depth of least and greatest fixed point operators, then the number of priorities in the associated games will be equal to that depth. Uh, so that highlights the importance of the number of priorities as a parameter uh, in parity games. And as we are going to see, the complexity of solving parity games, the computational complexity of solving parity games, will critically rely um, on that uh, parameter. So finally, let me uh, mention <coughs> why Knastatarsky fixed points are relevant. Turns out that uh, this uh, ability to form uh, fixed points in complete lattices um, is a very natural language to describe a host of problems in uh, model checking, abstract interpretation, and static analysis of programs. And in fact, uh, throughout um, 1980s and 1990s, uh, and uh, to this day, uh, it is quite common to uh, uh, simplify conceptually uh, analysis of various uh, logics of programs by uh, viewing the constructs in those logics as uh, uh, functions defined using fixed points, sometimes nested fixed points, uh, on uh, sets of states of the models considered. And finally, uh, let me now uh, briefly uh, summarize how uh, games uh, can be seen as a very natural model for reactive synthesis. So, in fact, uh, games have been used in verification. Uh, what is verification? Well, in verification, uh, the task typically is uh, that we are given a specification uh, and uh, an implementation that we hope uh, satisfies that specification. So implementation is a program, specification is a property of that or behaviors of that program. And uh, verification typically uh, allows us to conclude uh, using some algorithmic techniques uh, whether that implementation is correct, uh, that is its behaviors do satisfy uh, the specification or whether it is uh, incorrect. Now, um, looking at verification problems as uh, games is often quite um, enlightening uh, because um, rather than just getting um, an answer correct or incorrect, um, if we model a verification problem, for example, a model checking problem um, as a game, which in many contexts is, is very natural, uh, then what we get is more information because what we get in each of the cases are winning strategies. Either the winning strategy for one of the players, which is typically called the verifier, uh, or a winning strategy for the opponent, uh, which some people call the spoiler, who wants to, uh, whose aim is to uh, pinpoint uh, that uh, the implementation is incorrect, that there are circumstances under which it uh, fails to uh, satisfy the, the specification. So you can think of uh, the uh, these enriched outputs that come from game theoretic uh, understanding of uh, the verification process uh, as either a proof uh, in the form of a winning strategy for verifier, a proof that uh, the system is indeed correct, uh, or um, some structured uh, form of a description of what is wrong uh, with the uh, with the program uh, in the form of a winning strategy uh, for spoiler. Now the task in uh, synthesis is more ambitious than in verification. Uh, 
because you know people argue that uh, in verification we may over invest in producing an implementation that ends up uh, that turns out uh, being incorrect and uh, there is a loss of uh, effort wouldn't it be splendid if instead we just um, uh, were able to uh, uh, specify what we want and then an algorithmic uh, method uh, to produce to either say that this specification is realizable so that means there exists a program uh, that uh, meets it as well as producing an actual implementation um, or perhaps uh, the specification is unreli unrealizable uh, and wouldn't it be good then to uh, get some insights uh, about uh, why that is so uh, which perhaps um, might uh, allow a designer to adjust the specification. So again, uh, it is very natural to view uh, synthesis problems as games, and we are going to see one example of how uh, how this this uh, takes place technically. Uh, but again, uh, the um, at least in theory, the benefit of using uh, game theoretic methods and using games which are determined is that in each of the two cases, either realizable or unrealizable, uh, we are hoping to get uh, winning strategies for either of the two players. In this case, in the case of synthesis, they are often called the controller, the uh, uh, program that wants to um, uh, meet the specification or control the system in such a way that the specification is is met uh, or a winning strategy for the adversarial environment which gives insights about uh, uh, in what conditions uh, what conditions uh, may uh, uh, prevent from the program uh, being able to satisfy uh, a specification so um, how can we think about synthesis well uh, you might uh, come to this problem from the viewpoint of programs understood as uh, data transformers. If you take any uh, textbook in, in algorithms, uh, um, then uh, what are algorithmic problems? Well, they take inputs and they produce outputs and uh, they terminate and produce uh, outputs. Now, typically for an algorithmic problem to be interesting, uh, it needs to have infinitely many possible inputs. Um, and that causes such synthesis problems uh, and in fact even verification problems uh, easily undecidable as as soon as 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 uh, problems are uh, come from a, a slightly non-trivial uh, class uh, so that does not prevent people from trying to do that uh, there is a, a well-established line of research called deductive approach to program synthesis uh, where people uh, um, aim to prove realizability of desired functions which typically could take a form of uh, formula which says for every input there exists an output such that if certain precondition uh, is satisfied of the input if the input is of the right format let's say then some desired postcondition which is a relation between the input and the output holds so that's that's a kind of generic way of describing any uh, algorithmic problem understood as uh, as transforming inputs to uh, to outputs. Now, if you manage to deductively prove realizability, this realizability formula of this function described by by the relation between inputs and outputs, um, then you may hope to extract a program from that realizability proof. And you know there are people in uh, proof theory who who quite seriously. Uh, try to do things like that. But this is not what what we are going to focus on. We are going to focus instead on reactive synthesis. In reactive synthesis, rather than focusing on data transformation, in particular transforming infinite input domains into outputs, um, we focus instead on control uh, and on uh, finite input and output sets. However, to make things um, somewhat interesting, uh, we consider, but also applicable, uh, we consider uh, a scenario in which the programs that we would like to synthesize uh, are engaged uh, in an ongoing interaction with, uh, with the environment. And that interaction can take arbitrary uh, 
duration and in fact uh, we are going to uh, model that by an infinite uh, interaction uh, between uh, the program, the controller uh, and the environment. In such ongoing interactions and also given uh, the focus on control rather than on data transformation, uh, what is quite uh, natural is to um, specify correctness of such systems uh, in terms of uh, ordering of events that take place in such interactions. So in other words, uh, the correctness properties typically would take a uh, form of uh, so-called temporal properties. Now, there are many examples in which this methodology um, has been and is being uh, successfully applied. Notable examples is synthesis of hardware circuits, which is definitely a, a big success story of this approach, uh, but also things like device drivers, uh, robotic controllers, um, and many, many other um, contexts. Uh, now, what is common to those is that uh, they tend to be the reactive layer of so-called cyber physical systems, um, about which uh, uh, you can learn in Ufuk's um, tutorial. And I trust that uh, Ufuk will uh, mention reactive synthesis and uh, show uh, examples of the uses of reactive synthesis uh, in uh, not only in theory, but also uh, in practice. The model that um, is, has been very influential in this area and perhaps uh, the first uh, uh, formalization of this idea of synthesis, temporal synthesis, uh, is due to Church. So Church, uh, Alonso Church, back in 1950s, um, has posed uh, a challenge uh, where he um, considered uh, the model in which um, a controller, or as he called it, a circuit, a finite device, um, is involved in uh, interaction with the environment in a very simple manner. Namely, uh, in discrete at discrete time points, it keeps receiving inputs that come from some finite set um, i. The inputs are provided at discrete time points by the environment and the environment uh, continues providing those inputs forever so we can view the inputs as an infinite sequence of elements of that uh, finite set uh, input set i. Now at every step the program received such an input and is uh, required to produce an output which again is um, an element in a finite set uh, O of outputs. Church has formulated the following question. Assume that we are given a description of the desired uh, relationships between the infinite sequence of the inputs and the infinite sequence of the outputs, given in some uh, logical formalism, say. Um, is there an algorithm that can answer whether such a specification is realizable in the sense that there is a finite program, let's call it P, which for every input sequence, infinite input sequence, is capable to keep producing outputs that are based only on the information received uh, so far. Uh, so let's denote by P of alpha the sequence, infinite sequence of outputs produced in this manner, given an infinite sequence of inputs alpha, um, that satisfy this uh, specification. It was McNaughton in mid-1960s who has observed that uh, Church's synthesis problem uh, can be seen as uh, solving um, a game on a very simple graph. Um, a game in which the environment uh, has a finite number of states from which the environment chooses the input letters. And in turn, the controller has a finite number of states. Uh, and from each of those states, uh, the controller chooses um, output letters. So in other words, uh, we have this bipartite game 
um, or a game with a bipartite on a bipartite graph in which uh, the positions of the environment are the letters of the output but crucially the environment picks the input letters and positions of the controller are the letters the input letters uh, and from each of those uh, the controller picks the output letters so this is this uh, very simple game graph uh, with finite number of positions and the winning condition is provided by the specification so it's a uh, it's a relation on uh, infinite sequences or it's a sequence of vertices there it's a set of sequences uh, of vertices in this very simple game so the controller uh, wins uh, uh, an infinite sequence which is determined uniquely by the choices of the controller and the environment um, specified by these infinite input and output sequences if and only if the property um, uh, holds now, what are the desired uh, strategies in such uh, games that would correspond to these finite programs um, in Church's synthesis problem? Well, they are a very simple form of uh, transducers uh, or input-output automata that on any uh, input letter produced a single output letter. That's how um, Church's problem is, is formulated and uh, for that uh, formulation this very basic model of a synchronous uh, transducer is just the right uh, machine model. Uh, and the reactive synthesis then boils down to uh, finding a transducer uh, which is a winning strategy for controller in this uh, game with a very simple game graph but with uh, possibly complex uh, uh, winning condition. A solution of uh, Church's problem, at least for specifications given in monadic second order logic on infinite words, um, has been provided by Bichy and Landweber. And uh, soon after that, using slightly different techniques based on tree automata by Rabin. So the result of Bichy and Landweber uh, is that realizability for specifications in monadic second order logic on infinite words if is decidable. And what is uh, uh, also quite remarkable is that if a specification is realizable, then they have proved that then uh, a finite implementation exists. So there is a finite state device uh, which uh, realizes uh, realizes their specification. So so that is very satisfactory answer to uh, to Church's question, uh, and it turns out that the key underlying result here is finite memory determinacy of uh, omega regular games, so games in which the uh, winning sets are omega regular, because. Uh, by the results that uh, Mikoi has discussed in uh, in his tutorial on on logic, uh, we all know that um, the properties that are that can be expressed using monadic second order logic on words are exactly those that are recognized by uh, non-deterministic Bichy automata. Uh, that is the regular properties. So, how did Bichy and Landweber? Uh, solve a church's synthesis problem? Well, they used what we could call nowadays the logic automata games method. How does it look like? So we start with the specification formula phi and let's say it is given in monadic second order logic uh, on words, so it's a temporal property. Um, then by the results of Bichy from early 60s, uh, this can be translated effectively into a, a non-deterministic Bichy automaton that recognizes exactly all those words that are models of the original formula. Then, and crucially using uh, McNaughton's determinization construction, uh, we can produce an equivalent deterministic parity automaton. It is perhaps worth noting that uh, McNaughton's um, deterministic construction didn't actually produce 
a parity automaton. Instead, it uh, gave um, a Muller automaton or an automaton, a deterministic automaton on infinite words with the so called Muller acceptance conditions. But thanks to advances since uh, 1960s, uh, we now know we have we, we know techniques which allow to translate from Muller conditions uh, or Rabin conditions that were proposed by uh, Rabin uh, later on uh, into parity conditions, and somehow uh, we relegate this uh, one particular source of complexity to to automata theory, and uh, when solving games, we focus on uh, on parity conditions. But why did we need to determinize the automaton and what is actually the parity game over here? Um, let me discuss the need for determinization in a minute, but uh, for now let's let's actually describe the parity game. So note that the original Gale Stewart game proposed by McNaughton uh, had a very simple uh, arena. It was just a bipartite graph uh, with positions that corresponded to uh, inputs uh, input uh, letters and uh, output letters. Now the game we are going to consider is going to have more complex state space or uh, set of positions but a simpler winning condition which is just going to be a parity condition. So the positions are going to be pairs, a letter and a state of the automaton. And in a way the role of the automaton is going to uh, be to listen to what the players decide which letters they pick in every round of the game and adjust the state of the uh, deterministic automaton accordingly because this deterministic automaton is uh, over the alphabet which is pairs of input and output letters uh, and the parity uh, it will be a parity game because the winning condition will be um, a parity condition that is simply inherited from the acceptance condition uh, of the automaton. So do we actually need deterministic automata? So what if we, instead of constructing the product game of the original uh, Gale Stewart game and a deterministic automaton, what if we constructed a game which is analogously a product of the original Gale Stewart game uh, arena and um, a non-deterministic Bichy automaton? Well, um, one problem here would be uh, that uh, a non-deterministic automaton may have multiple transitions. So there would be some sort of uh, uh, choice here uh, which uh, will have to be resolved, um, preferably by one of the two players, and it actually makes quite good sense for um, the controller to uh, take those choices. So for the controller to decide which transitions of the automaton that verifies the specification um, uh, to pick because the automaton is interested in finding an accepting run and hence satisfying the specification. Uh, however, that is problematic if the automaton is uh, an arbitrary uh, non-deterministic automaton because non-deterministic automata are not necessarily causal or uh, using more modern terminology, uh, history deterministic. Uh, in the sense that um, an automaton may be unable, an, on, an arbitrary non-deterministic automaton may be unable to uh, use the same transitions to accept two words that share a common prefix. Uh, a non-deterministic automaton, in other words, may need to know the future, so to say, uh, in order to pick uh, a transition at any uh, position in the world. Um, secondly, uh, what we could do instead would be to, uh, rather than using uh, deterministic parity automata, we could consider using deterministic uh, Bichy uh, automata. Uh, however, uh, they are less expressive than non-deterministic Bichy automata and hence uh, we need uh, parity conditions, which uh, uh, which are sufficient because there is a determinization from non-deterministic BC to uh, deterministic uh, parity. Uh, we are going to to take a look at uh, some alternatives uh, to um, using deterministic uh, parity automata, um, but uh, let's first uh, take a look at the complexity of uh, 
the Behe and Landweber solution. So for specifications in uh, monadic second order logic on words, uh, unfortunately this approach, like for satisfiability, uh, uh, results often results or may result in non-elementary blow-up uh, of the size of the automaton. Uh, that's because uh, uh, translation of uh, MSO uh, formulas into automata may involve complementations, uh, linear number of complementations, uh, and uh, every complementation may result in exponential blow-up. In fact, Stockmeyer uh, has uh, rigorously established that satisfiability and hence also realizability for uh, MSO on words uh, is in fact non-elementary, so it cannot be bounded by any uh, uh, tower of uh, uh, exponentials of, of, bounded, uh, of bounded height. Now, the, there is also a blow-up and uh, price to pay for determinization. Uh, the original McNaughton's construction was doubly exponential, so there was a doubly exponential increase in the number of states from the original non-deterministic automaton to uh, a deterministic uh, Muller in uh, McNaughton's case uh, condition, um, which seems uh, modest compared to the non-elementary blow-up in a translation from logic to automata, but it's still uh, quite painful. Uh, now. Safra in 1980s has for the first time come up with uh, an optimal uh, complementation, sorry, determinization construction, uh, which involved only singly exponential blow up. And that was a very influential result because it, uh, it has uh, spurred uh, a lot of feather work um, in applications of uh, 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 automata theoretic methods uh, in logic and in particular uh, in uh, applications to uh, logics other than the monadic second order logic. So one very influential um, example was uh, temporal logic. So it was Pnueli in late 1970s who proposed to uh, use uh, linear temporal logic for uh, specification and, uh, and verification. And uh, soon after Safra's uh, determinization construction, Pnueli and Rosner have uh, established that uh, if we take specifications in linear temporal logic, then the reactive synthesis problem is in fact uh, solvable in doubly exponential time. And later on, Rosner has established that this is indeed uh, to x time uh, complete. So here's a picture of this automat logic automata games method for uh, for the synthesis problem. Uh, the picture is the same as we've discussed uh, before, but here we also uh, take a look at uh, what uh, cost, uh, what computational complex, what computational cost is involved in uh, starting from monadic second order logic specifications. It's already non-elementary in the first step from the for uh, uh, for the logic to automata translation for LTL the the, the blow ups are more modest the first translation from uh, formulas to automata is only singly exponential and then uh, because the um, determinization construction of Safra is again exponential the number of states uh, uh, goes to doubly exponential after determinization uh, uh, however the number of priorities is only singly exponential uh, so uh, in the in the end what we get is a deterministic parity uh, automaton and then a parity game of doubly exponential size. So uh, although uh, uh, translations from logic to automata and then determinization constructions are very critical, obviously when you uh, when they incur a doubly exponential blow up, uh, in order for this this to be practical, you better have uh, uh, very good and uh, algorithm engineer algorithms engineering uh, techniques to uh, uh, make sure that uh, these blow ups these theoretical blow ups uh, do not hurt too much in practice. Uh, but it is also quite important to be able to solve parity games um, efficiently because these parity games can be quite large. And until uh, quite recently, all um, algorithms for solving parity games were unfortunately exponential in the number of priorities. That uh, critical parameter that we have discussed uh, earlier, for example, in the context of uh, uh, nested fixed points. Uh, now, 
a truly groundbreaking result uh, just a few years ago uh, was obtained by Kaluda, Jane, Husainov, Lee and Stefan, who have uh, managed to obtain the first uh, fixed parameter tractable algorithm for solving parity games when the parameter is the number of priorities. So that, that's a major advance. Uh, in fact, uh, their algorithm works in uh, quasi-polynomial time in general. Uh, uh, and the complexity is in fact exponential only in the logarithm of the number of priorities. So that's a major advance from uh, linear number, uh, lin something uh, linear in the number of priorities in the exponent. Um, and moreover, it is in polynomial time if the number of priorities is only logarithmic in the number of uh, positions um, in the game. Now note that, that uh, here indeed uh, this is the case uh, in the parity games that are obtained from uh, LTL synthesis. Uh, so one could argue that uh, this really uh, um, uh, solves the problem of applications of parity games um, to, uh, to um, LTL reactive synthesis. However, I, I, I believe that it's still interesting to um, uh, find better algorithms, and uh, in particular algorithms that are good not only in theory but, uh, but also in practice. So finally, uh, let us uh, come back to the question of whether we can avoid determinization in this uh, solution, Bichy Landweber solution uh, of, uh, uh, of Church's synthesis problem. Uh, and as I have already hinted, uh, there could be a way to, to uh, in fact, use non-deterministic automata. And it was Hensinger and Peterman who have uh, come up with a formal concept uh, of a so-called, what, what they called good for games, non-deterministic automata, a concept that was later rediscovered and, uh, uh, and called uh, somewhat more generally uh, history deterministic automata by Thomas Colcombe. Um, uh, and uh, that can be um, uh, described in the following way. We would say that uh, an automaton uh, on words A is good for games or history deterministic. Um, if, um, and here is a game theoretic uh, characterization again, if it is the case that if we consider a game in which you have two players, an automaton and spoiler, and the automaton tries to produce uh, accepting runs, and a uh, spoiler has the power to pick words. So spoiler in every round of the game, so to say, the spoiler picks letters, input letters, and then the automaton uh, needs to pick uh, valid transitions uh, given the current state of the automaton and the letter that was ha that has just been picked by the spoiler. So, um, and then, um, we say that uh, the automaton wins in an infinite uh, play of such a game, or finite if uh, if uh, we we consider finite automaton, because this uh, uh, this uh, um, definition could indeed be uh, applied to to uh, automaton finite words uh, as well. If it is the case that um, the resulting run that is produced, note that uh, together spoiler and automaton produce runs because spoiler picks letters and uh, automaton picks uh, transitions. Um, so an automaton, uh, the automaton player wins such a pair word and run if it is the case that um, the word being in the language implies that the run picked is accepting. So in other words, uh, an automaton wins in this game if they can choose transitions in a history deterministic way, uh, based only on uh, the letters that have been read so far. Now this definition is exactly what is needed um, to make that product construction uh, with a non-deterministic automaton correct. So if that non-deterministic automaton happens to be good for games, then the resulting game in which the controller is also given the responsibility to pick the transitions, um, uh, it is equivalent to the Gale Stewart game in which the winning condition is um, provided uh, as the language recognized by the automaton. Now the properties, constructions uh, of um, 
these good for games automata and their uses in synthesis uh, are a topic of ongoing uh, current research um, and there are even a few experts uh, 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 on this uh, in the theoretical foundations uh, of computer systems program at Simons.